I want to start this series by reading some words of Jesus. And, and these words of Jesus are, um, we believe they're inspired, we believe they're authoritative, and we believe they have meaning for the church today. They are this, Mark chapter 4, verse 30. He continued, what is a good image for God's kingdom? What parable can I use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. When scattered on the ground, it's the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. But when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all vegetable plants. I want to read that because, well, I wanted to do a teaching on the kingdom of God instead of science, but then I was like, well, I promise I talk science, so we're going to do that. So here, here's the deal. I'm going to get so blunt today that I, I, just, I just want us to, to realize something. Can I show you a picture of what a mustard seed is? There's your mustard seed, and then there's like an orchid seed. Now, now, hear, hear, hear me on this. Go, go back to the passage, just really quick, right? The smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Jesus says this. Any of you think Jesus is a dummy? <laughs> if you raise your hand, you're, you're really risky. Yeah, 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 don't do that. I'm raising my hand, so I'll, I'll probably pass out after the service and not wake up for a long time until Lauren kisses me with true love's kiss. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I like that kiss. Um, okay, so let's just keep it real, right? Christians get married for a reason. Anyway, sorry, wife, I love you. And I'm shoveling poop, just so you know. Um, Jesus makes a statement about something that is real to us, and Jesus says, this is the smallest of all of the seeds on the planet. I happen to know that this is not true. Like, here's just one example, right? Now, if I were planting flowers or mustard seed, and I, I were kind of looking at this, I would say, mustard seed is one of many small seeds to scatter around. But Jesus doesn't have room for that in his worldview because where he lives, when he lives, he knows that the smallest seed available to him is a mustard seed. And as we all do, Jesus universalizes that statement into being, it's the smallest on all the earth because we know based on the data in front of us. Jesus was flat out wrong. Have any of you ever heard this passage before, by the way? Maybe some of you? And, and noticed that? I don't know. Some, like, when that was first pointed out to me, I was like, oh, that can't be. No, Jesus, Jesus is never wrong. Jesus can't be wrong. I follow Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. Except here, I don't. I want to be more right than Jesus. <sighs> Made me question my salvation and stuff. No, but it really begs a very important question. If Jesus makes a claim that is absolutely untrue, who do we trust? And if we were to take Jesus at Jesus' word, right? If we were to take Jesus literally here, which I think Jesus literally believes that's a true statement. I don't think um, in Jesus' humanity, the emptied Jesus, the Jesus who is both God and human, but has taken on the encounter of human life fully as human. I don't think Jesus has the information available to him in his humanity to know any different. Sure, he could like pray and he's connected to the Father, right? And so probably could get that information, but Jesus doesn't care because it doesn't matter, right? Because Jesus isn't even trying to propose a scientific theory. Jesus is trying to propose a vision of the kingdom of God. He doesn't have in mind, oh, people are going to hear what I've said, and 2,000 years down the road, they're going to say, well, Jesus has to be right because Jesus is always right, and if Jesus isn't right, then nothing is right. And then, right? Like, like Jesus doesn't even think of those categories. And yet, over and over again, We've tried to make the Bible, we've tried to make Scripture say something it absolutely isn't trying to say. So what I want to do this morning, with that as our foundation, 
is I want to simply lay a case for why the way we talk about science and Christianity is problematic in most circles in North America. A, a couple of caveats. Number one, if this is something you've never thought of, this might be like ripping off a Band-Aid, and I get it. In 2008, I was sharing with some folks before service. In 2008, this was brand new information to me. I'd like changed my views on pretty much everything. And then I was like, oh, this is a deal. This is like a thing that some Christians believe that biological evolution could stand up next to scripture. And you're going to hear me talking about that, and we're going to unpack that. But if this is your first time hearing anything like that, then I, I want to just let you know that it's okay. It's okay. And by the end of this series, I hope to show you not that the Bible teaches evolution. It doesn't. I hope to show you that the Bible doesn't teach science at all. And that we're free to sit with science as science, and we're free to sit with God as God. And if we start to get those two things too intermingled, you come up with these conundrums where Jesus makes a scientific claim about reality that the seed of mustard is the smallest of all of them, and then all you got to do is look at other seeds and know that Jesus is wrong. And if Jesus is wrong here, he's wrong about salvation, he's wrong about the resurrection, he's wrong about, right, like, and then why be a Christian? Ah, I'm going to college to become not Christian. You know, like, these are the sorts of things that set people up on a trajectory away from Jesus. But here's the problem. Most of us were given the wrong tools for how to read the Bible. And if we have the wrong tools for how to read the Bible, of course we're going to come up with, like, I thought the Bible was a list of facts, and this fact is wrong, therefore it's wrong, right? But that's not what the Bible does. If that's what we want the Bible to be, we need a different book. If you want the Bible to be a list of facts and ideas and rules that always are true about every aspect of reality, you need to find someone else to write the book. In fact, you need to find about 66 others or so. Well, not quite 66. You get the idea, right? Like, you don't have that in the Bible. It is only in modernity that certain people have decided that it has to be true in everything it speaks about. Factually true. In the early 1900s, you may have heard of this thing called the Scopes Monkey Trials. I don't know if you know about this, but basically what ends up happening is they put evolution and God on trial. Like, there's this, it's really fascinating. Um, Rachel Held Evans actually breaks this out in her book called, um, it used to be called Evolving in Monkey Town. I think they changed the title, but they're, it, what, Faith Unraveled, is that it? Yeah, so, so she really breaks this out. It's really interesting because she grew up in that town. But the short of it is, what ends up happening kind of during that time is evolutionary biology becomes one of the things that is shaping the scientific revolution. What you end up having is this resistance movement that becomes called fun fundamentalism. And fundamentalism has a strong problem with science. And so the trajectory goes, and what is born out of fundamentalism eventually is something that I think is much better than fundamentalism in about the 50s or so. It's called evangelicalism. And evangelicalism inherits some of the fruit of fundamentalism. And so what we have as um, 21st century Jesus followers, who this church is birthed out of that long kind of trajectory, you have all of this sort of background information that is loaded with cultural conditioned assumptions that we just bring into how we read the Bible, how we talk about the world, how we talk about politics, how we talk about anything. And what's interesting is in the last couple of decades, a bunch of folks within that movement, myself included, some of you included, have called it into question. Whether it be science, politics, violence, these sorts of things. Like, we have said, the package of goods isn't what the Bible actually says. And so, so this series is actually trying to get us to not say, ah, oh, Jesus is wrong, we can't trust Jesus, what a dummy. We're actually trying to say, what if we read the Bible better so that Jesus actually isn't a dummy? Huh? How many things have you said that are dumb? Probably a lot, right? I don't say dumb things, but you do. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and it's interesting to me that if, if um, we can honestly notice that what we believe about reality today has shifted, even in t the last 10 years, in the last 20 years. Uh, 
we've got to understand that everything that we say about factual reality is always in flux for humankind. And if Jesus fully enters as a human, we've got to take that very seriously. And in fact, if the Bible is written by humans, we have to take that extra seriously, inspired by God's Spirit. But we also have to ask, what does that mean when humans are the ones penning the thing? And God's Spirit is kind of inviting them into that writing journey, right? There's a lot of things that the Bible says that aren't true. But what it is trying to say are all kinds of things that are true. Does that make sense? So the Bible can say something that's absolutely not true, but what it's trying to say is absolutely true. So Jesus says, the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds, and yet it grows. Thus, the kingdom of God is in, in this way, right? The kingdom part is true. The mustard seed part is inconsequential to what he's actually trying to say. There is something important here, and there is something inconsequential here. But here's what happens in Christian circles that really leads to atheism. We make the Bible's inconsequential things the important things. And we pull the humanity out of it, and we come up with words like inerrancy to try and say the Bible is always true and it's always right. And then when we figure out it can't be always true and always right, here's what we do. We say, well... In the original manuscripts, it was always right and always true. But since we don't have access to the original manuscripts, over time, manuscript copyists made small minor mistakes. So anytime you see small minor mistakes, they're the result of a process. They're not what it was in the, the original. As a, a lot of faith statements go to churches that are more conservative, they'll say in the original autographs to be all technical. And I'm like, no, that's, it probably wasn't. I mean, there's certainly a transmission history, but gang, it was wrong back there, it's wrong here. And it's okay. This is what we like to do. I think I've shown this one other time in our history. Yeah, there's Darwin and Jesus duking it out. Now, um, I like that Jesus only because he's big and bad. He's got his holes in his hands, so he's obviously uh, the resurrected Lord ready to thrash creation into obedience. Um, you know... <laughs> Thrashing things into obedience is much more effective than wooing them. I'm just going to tell you. So if you could beat the out of Darwin, right? Peace out, mother boom, right? Like if you can really, like, like that is one method of getting your will accomplished. The problem is Jesus doesn't work that way, as we know. But that's how we portray Jesus in culture for the last hundred years. And I want to share with you that that's just the wrong Jesus in so many ways. You know, the Bible has another thing that it says that's absolutely not true, and this is the one that's going to cause us to have to really wrestle. Exodus chapter 20 reflects on it in the Ten Commandments. This is what it says. It says, Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh, that is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We know that the universe is like 14 billion years old. And it took a long time to get here. The Bible says six days. And then God took a nap on the seventh. Interesting, right? And, and how is this true? Well, it's true in that it's evoking something Genesis 1 actually says. But is it true in the sense that it's literally trying to tell us the mechanism through which God created the world? Or is there something more going on here? So when we approach Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and passages like this, the Psalms that talk about creation, we already have a problem. Did God create? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did God create that way? No. We just know that, right? Like, we just know it didn't happen like that. So why is it depicted like that? Why is the smallest mustard seed, uh, or the smallest seed a mustard seed, Right? Because the kingdom of God grows. Because God created. That's where we have to start this conversation. If we don't start there, we're, we're going to mess up everything we're trying to be about, right? This is literally wrong. Not just like, it's kind of wrong. Like, it is literally wrong. And I use the word literally sort of metaphorically a lot of the time. Like, it was literally this big. It's not. But here, it's literally wrong. Metaphorically, God did do it in six days. 
experientially for God, who knows? Cosmologically, much longer than six days. Much longer than 6,000 years, or whatever the math works out to be if you read Genesis hyper-literally. I, I actually believe in more like this. Yeah, I think that's what happened. <laughs> I don't, actually, <laughs> but isn't that awesome? Um, all of us want to be, strive to evolve to the status of Homer sapiens. Um, that, yeah, he's my role model, so, um, yeah, banana, he's, he's really made it far. Um, have you ever, wow, have you ever thought that Homer, Homer Simpson's face is kind of like a minion? Weird. Anyway, um, by saying the word banana, it made me think of this. Anyway, weird connections happening up here. This is now, now, if we take this really literally, man, we can really come up with a cool theory. Okay, so um, we do that too much. So here, here's, here's the deal. Here's what science teaches, and, and what my assumptions are going to be during the series are this, okay? We're just going to throw it all out there right now. The universe, approximately 13.7 billion years ago, emerged. Okay? That's what science says. It's not what the Bible says. That's what science says. The first forms of cellular life on Earth were about 4.5 billion years ago. This is every science book in America that wasn't made by a homeschooling network that's trying to keep their kids out of secular schools. Okay? Just saying it. All species descended from, a common, from common ancestors and find their origin in a single-celled organism. So 4.5 billion years ago, cells show up, these cells start doing things, and common ancestry is just how we understand the cosmos. Now, by, by the way, caveat, caveat, I don't think biological evolution is absolute. I think it's the best science we have available to us as 21st century people. Um, I think we're always going to grow and expand and probably get better at this. And, and so I don't put my eggs in these things being absolutes. I put my, my eggs in the paradigm scripture is trying to invite me into. But that's the best truth we know at the moment. And so I don't want to say that it's not true either. Does that make sense? Here we keep going. Species change over time through mutations in DNA. DNA. Dino DNA. You guys remember that? Yeah. Oh, man. That's still my dream. Let's just create Jurassic Park and go play with dinos and then let them kill us. Did you, anyone see the, like, the newest Jurassic Park? Totally ridiculous thesis. Anyway, I, I, it was interesting because there was a lot of slaughter, but there was, to me, it was just like, really, like you didn't learn the first time that this is a bad idea, so you're going to make genetically modified worse one? Anyway, I'm sorry, that's just, I guess we do that in our culture, though. Um, the first humans evolved from a tribe of chimp-like apes in Africa six to seven million years ago, okay? And Homo sapiens, as we know them today, can be dated to about 200,000 years ago. So, here's my big idea for the whole series. We don't have a science problem. We have a Bible problem. We, we have nothing. No kind of problem with science. We shouldn't. We have a Bible problem. And if, if we're going to be people who are honest and raise kids to not go to college and become atheists, but to actually have the handles and tools they need to follow Jesus, we've got to get better at the Bible. So many people assume when we talk about these kinds of issues, right? I've, I've had a lot of conversations over the years through my blogging and all that kind of stuff, right, with people. I get spam comments all the time with like 15,000 verses from the King James Bible about how sinful I am and how, how wrong evolution is, right? This is just, yeah. And I've had all these conversations. And what, what people often fail to miss is that when we're talking about an issue like this, it is rooted in, I want to take the Bible seriously. I don't care about science, except insofar that science, when the Bible's taking a, a bad posture, creates this problem, right? Like it creates this like, can I be both? And so I want to even say it gets worse. I want to show you a couple of things. So, so here's some stats from the last uh, five years or so, right? So here is 18 to 29-year-olds. Um, I think this is 2011. Christians are too confident that they know all the answers. 17% at that time said, true of me, like in a complete way. Mostly true of me, 35%, right? Um, if you 
go all the way through here. Christianity is anti-science. At least 9% of young adults with a Christian background thought that. Um, and then 25% at least were willing to say almost true, right? Keep going. Um, Christianity is anti-intellectual. Well, the stat gets a little better, right? But, but here's the problem. A lot of people polled in polls like this come with the baggage of, you know, we can prove creation is true through better science, and so we come up with pseudoscience, right? Come up with things like um, evolution isn't possible because macro evolution versus micro, right? We have all these weird categories. If you've been in that conversation, we try and, like, make God into something that it couldn't possibly be evolution, so it must be all these other things. Let's find every hole in science that we know today, and we're going to expand the holes, amplify the holes, because if we can expand the holes, then we can expose how scientists are all a bunch of PhD dummies, right? I mean, an estimate, it's in the 90-something percent, and so this isn't an, I don't have this stat written down, but you can look this up. Something like 90-ish percent of Christians who are scientists, like in the field scientists, evolution is a, non, a non-issue. These are Christian scientists, not like the, the, the secular or the, I don't use the word cult very often, but you know what I'm talking about, right? The, yeah, <laughs> not, not the one with the reading room and yeah, um, the actor who's funny. Um, Matri- is he in the Matrix? Is that that guy? No, another one. Which one? Scientology, they're probably all the same. Who cares? Um, (laughs) Listener, I'm sorry if I offended your religious conviction. I'm not trying to. I'm just ignorant. Okay. Um, But but you get the idea, right? So some of this data is even skewed by people who have the assumption that the Truth Project has given them the right resources to engage them in actual science because the real scientific world is a bunch of malarkey, right? Right? So, so again, but you're starting to see a trend in young adults who are saying, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm getting uncomfortable. And here's young adults, reasons why they're leaving the church. This is a, another survey at the same time. Churches come across as antagonistic to science. This was reason number three on a list of something like 10 reasons young adults are leaving the church. Um, and interestingly enough, 72% of religiously unaffiliated people hold to evolution, right? So, so this is like, if you, you stack all of this up and you start to notice a trend is happening here. But then, like, so increasingly, new generations are open to scientific data as Christianity is moving from the center of our culture towards the margins of our culture, especially in pockets like the Northwest. And then you have this perpetuation problem, though. Check this out. Pastors were polled. And among Protestant pastors, the statement, I believe God used evolution to create people, 64% polled strongly disagree. Not just kind of have uncomfortable ideas about this, like, not like God somehow took Adam and Eve out of this pocket of evolution and made them special, but like, just in general, could not have used that process. 64%. Let me tell you something about the other percentage in there. Most of them are afraid to even talk about it. Jobs are on the line. Let me tell you about it. I've worked in churches where if I got too into this, I'd be fired. Right? It's crazy. Pastors' salaries are on the line around issues like this. But here's what's terrible to me. is it, It's in those same settings where kids and young adults are running out. They're going away. So the very thing they're trying to prevent, they're actually causing and I'm not putting the blame on the pastor per se, I'm putting the blame on the entire culture we've created around these kinds of issues, these false dichotomies, these false polarities that leave a lot of pastors in situations where she or he is bound. It's like, do I feed my family or do I talk about this truly? Right? And so it perpetuates. Ah, yeah, so... God is not dead. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, youth group, you should check that out, right? Like, but there's probably, like, some of them have this, like, hesitancy, like it's awkward. I'm going to tell you something, that on one end of the spectrum is there are pastors who simply have not engaged the Bible in the ways we're going to be engaging it, and had they the handles and tools to do it, they might actually be wooed towards at least science could be a possible thing to hold out as real, Right? So there are those pastors. There are a few that I would say are just rigid and would never entertain that. And then there are some who are just scared to talk about it. 
And, and we shouldn't demonize any of those categories. We should simply say it is a cultural problem and someone has to start the conversation. And it's not us, it's already been starting over the last decade or so, but we need to engage that conversation to help sort of tilt the conversation a better direction. That's why we're doing that here at this church. Beyond that, we're trying to tilt the conversation because the more kids we start having here, the more of a culture. Look, if any of you ever came up to me when our kids' ministry is growing or whatever, and you said, I want to have a lesson on creationism, I'm going to say no. No. You want to talk about God as creator? Absolutely. If you want to talk about creationism as in creation science, that doesn't happen here because you're perpetuating a system that creates atheists unnecessarily. And the gospel is too important for that. The gospel is too important for feeling secure in our literalism and our beliefs about what the text has to mean to me because I've always been told it means this. No. The gospel is too important for that. Now, will we make room for folks who don't believe in evolution? Absolutely. There's a lot of them, and I don't, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is not having the ability to just hold out the options and say, here they are. What I have a problem with is the, the constant language I hear about, if you believe in evolution and you claim to be a Christian, you're really an atheist and just don't know it. <laughs> I'm really an atheist? Were you with me the other day when I was praying with Jesus and we were having this amazing encounter? Like, we're, like, like really, like, I'm an atheist. That's the problem. We have this weird cultural baggage. So we need to relearn how to read the Bible as the ancient documents that they are. Historically, if you call the Bible ancient documents, what you evoke in some people is the sense that you're, you're sort of like demoting the Bible to something less than. By not having this belief that God somehow dropped the Bible out of the sky, you have, in that moment, for some people, sort of demoted it to the status of just another classical text. It's just like reading Homer, right? Just like reading the Odyssey. And we don't believe those things are true, so if, if we don't believe those things are true, then we can't believe that the Bible is true in your situation, so it has to be elevated. And we do elevate the Bible. We do believe the scriptures are central. I do believe the power of scripture with the Holy Spirit involved has the ability to change your life. I 100% affirm that. But before we get there, we have to get here. That these are ancient documents written in a classical world that we have to engage like we engage a classical text. And so what I want to do is eventually move towards like what that means for us in the next few minutes. Well, first of all, here's something that helped me a lot. Um, St. Augustine, who I, I don't agree with all the time. Uh, I, I, really, I really don't agree with St. Augustine quite a bit, actually. I think he got Paul very wrong and set the church up on a weird trajectory for reading Paul wrong. I think he had a weird view of like who God chooses and some of these things. Like I, I just have some problem. But 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 when it came to intellectual ideas, this guy got it. He he came up with this thing called the two book approach to God's revelation. That there is a book of science, nature that reveals things about reality, and there is a book of scripture that does the exact same thing. And anytime these come into conflict, we have to be willing to reevaluate how we read the Bible. That was Augustine, one of the patron saints of every church, right? Not only did he go that far, if you saw the quote in the opening video, he actually goes as far as saying, if we don't do that thing well, people who aren't Christians will look at us and say, look how silly these people are, and we're actually perpetuating them not being Christian. This is Augustine, the you know, fourth century, fifth century, right? Like, this is a long time ago. So I want you to have that as an image in your mind as we approach these things. That if we can see both and be willing to confront both, that might be a good thing. I want to keep going here a little bit and um, jump ahead to the ways we do this. So how do we read the Bible? How do we really, and I want to give you these tools. This is something, by the way, if, if you haven't written these kind of things down before, this is worth writing down or taking a picture of or coming back to because um, what I want to do right now is just sort of 
outline what we're going to do in this series when it comes to how we approach the Bible. This is something that you could take home with you. You can start thinking about with your own personal Bible studies that, that if, if we can do these things well, we're going to read the Bible better. But if we don't, we're going to find ourselves asking the question, is Jesus a liar about mustard seed? Right? So here we go. Here, here's my list. We start with the authorial att- intent, author's intent. Now, the author's intent is so important because if we can figure out what the author is doing, we can then ask the other questions, right? So why is Paul writing to a church in Corinth? Well, there's some disruption happening in the worship setting. So Paul will take four chapters to talk about what speaking in tongues is, how it works, how to not do it too often, and how it it, um, has limits because it's really like the minor gift out of all this other stuff, right? Paul will then talk about things like, hey, incest isn't a good idea. Sleeping with your mother-in-law, also not a good idea, right? Like, Paul will break all these things down, and his intent is to build into the church at Corinth so it doesn't keep getting crazy, right? He'll write to Rome, and in, in Romans, what we have is this sense that nations people called Gentiles have become arrogant about their new status in God's kingdom. And so Jews, who may have been expelled from the city for a while, have permission now to be brought back into the city in the early 60s. And as they come back into the city, these Gentile Christians aren't being hospitable. And in their lack of hospitality, Paul comes around and says, hey, 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 no. Like, you're just a little bit of a branch. Like, this is the tree. Like, your Jewish sisters and brothers are like the thing. You've just been grafted into this movement. Don't forget who you are, right? So Paul's intent is so important. Any author's intent matters like crazy. It also matters that we know the genre. If you don't know the genre of a text, you're going to make it say things it never was meant to say, right? Genre. So for instance, even within one book, you might have multiple genres. For instance, Genesis chapter one is kind of a compilation of traditions, or Genesis in general is a compilation of a few traditions. And so Within these four, probably, traditions, what you have is different time periods these are being written and different purposes and different things, right? And so it's kind of spliced apart in a lot of ways. We're going to really get into Genesis 1 over the next several weeks. Um, But genre matters because in the first chapter, you have a poetic yet storytelling sort of thing, right? It's not exactly poetry, but it's not exactly historical either. It's kind of a fusion. Some would call it a liturgy, right? And so we have to note the genre because if we're reading something that is poetry as though it's didactic, meaning here's what it says, here's what you need to know, right? If we mix up categories, you're going to start saying things that just don't make sense. Words and rhetoric kind of fall into that, right? Sometimes words are used in ways that are so intentional that, um, you know, Paul in Galatians he says, I am perplexed. I am astounded. Yeah, 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 circumcision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't know the story, it's okay. Paul is this traveling preacher. So he writes all these letters and he basically tells churches, you're doing great. Not so much. You're out. And you know, like that's kind of what he's trying to do here in, in general. And, and so Paul speaks into the Galatian situation. He uses this language, this rhetoric of actually ironic rebuke. But if you don't know that Paul's being ironic, you take it and you say, wow, Paul is kind of mean. Well, he he was kind of upset, but he really wasn't that upset. It's really more about him using a very well-known Greco-Roman irony device to actually say how ironic it is that you want to be circumcised when, in fact, Christ died so you didn't have to become Jewish. And his whole book is trying to draw out the irony of that situation so that by the end they're persuaded, neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, right? And so, so, again, words and rhetoric really matter. Jesus can use hyperbole all the time in his statements about um, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word, right? Like, like these, are, these are rhetorical devices for talking about something deeper. Keep going, cultural context, geography, religion, empire, customs, recent history, assumptions, etc. Like if we don't know the cultural context, then we can't come into what the text actually is saying, Right? What we do then is we read it as 21st century people, and we say, oh, it must mean this because that's how it feels to me. And that's not how you read the Bible. You just can't do that. 
we have to do the hard work of saying, what cultural historical tools are available to me, and how can I use those to then enter the text and then move out of the text into the 21st century? We also have the narrative flow of a passage. Where does this passage of scripture exist within the larger passage uh, of the book, right? So Genesis chapter 1 is placed at the beginning because it has this awesome line in the beginning, right? And it has something to say, and there's a narrative flow to Genesis. But interestingly enough, you come to it, and right next door to it is a brand new creation story. Why did, the, why did the compilers actually put these two very different creation stories side by side? Well, it wasn't because we had to harmonize them. It was because one is dealing with one kind of issue, and one is dealing with a different kind of issue, and we're going to talk about that. They are two distinct creation stories. You don't have to harmonize them. They're not intended for that. But if you don't know the flow of the book and how that all works together, you're going to start assuming things that aren't true. But it goes even further, because we want to know the redemptive movement of a passage, the narrative of scripture. This is where we get theological, right? So far, we've been historical. I know we're nerding out. Keep, keep with me. This is very important, though. Historical, historical, rhetorical, rhetorical. What's it doing? How's it function? Blah, blah, blah. Then we move towards how does this fit with the rest of the canon? The canon being the 66 books of the Bible. Jesus can say in one part, you have heard it said back in that other part of the Bible, eye for eye, but I say to you, love right? Jesus in that moment is setting up a trajectory. It used to be this way, but the trajectory has changed. But if we don't pay attention to redemptive movement, in other words, that God can be experienced in one place this way, but it's not the full picture because God is movement. God is moving. You get to other places and you forget and you get weird interpretations of things, right? So we've got to place it within the larger, and this is for Christians, right? This is a Christian exercise. Theology is for Christians. We believe this book has something to say to our world, and so once we've done all the hard groundwork, we come to the theological layer and we say, what does it say to us now? I, I, I hope what this does is it just sets us up I hope you can have this framework in the back of your mind because we're, we're going to get at some stuff and it's not going to be hard to understand. It's just going to be new. I, I honestly think a lot of this is going to be new information for most of us. But it's going to be good information. And, and the outcome isn't, oh, man, I feel so smart now. You know? Well, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of over that. I hope you're over that too. Like, new theories make me feel good because I feel smarter than other Christians. That's just... No, 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 this has real implications for real people. Because if we don't do the hard work, all kinds of bad ideas come out. Global warming can't be true. Because we can't trust those same guys who say evolution is true, right? Like, do you see how it all kind of builds on each other and gains a head of steam? And by the end of it, we get this cultural package of goods that just makes us outright unhelpful to the world around us. And the kingdom of God is about how can we actually be a presence of help, a presence of rescue, a presence of healing, a presence of good. And here's Paul, Paul in Romans 14 says, like, kind of where I hope we, we set the tone here a little bit as we wrap up. He says, so stop judging each other. Instead, this is what you should decide. Never put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. Let's stop putting blocks where there should be roads. Let's stop making walls with stones where we should be building bridges. Let's stop being the kind of Christians who say we know and you don't, but if you adhere to our cognitive beliefs, your life's going to be better. Let's be the kind of Christians who embody a better life intellectually astute to what reality is so that others can say, oh, I don't have to be a dummy after all. I don't have to check my brains at the door if I want to be religious. In fact, some of the most brilliant people in the planet are not only religious but followers of Jesus in a devout way. That's where we're going. Science is cool. Yay. And science doesn't save anyone, but
but neither does a faith trapped in an anti-scientific posture. 